Hey, what's up guys, welcome back to the channel. On today's episode, we're gonna be talking about what is probably the best way to cut metal, okay? And this way is not new, but it's definitely being pushed this direction by this tool and probably the people that make this tool. So a lot of people are gonna be moving towards this direction, if not the industry, okay? So obviously there are a lot of ways to cut metal, but two primary categories, like a hot cut or a cold cut, <laughs> sandwich meat. Uh, so hot cut primarily being, uh, you know, a plasma cutter or like an abrasive disc or something like that. Uh, or a cold cut, meaning like a band saw, port band um, even a circular saw with a metal blade on it, or even a miter saw with a blade on it, okay? And that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Don't let the rails on this thing fool you. This is not a sliding compound dual bevel miter saw, or is it? You know, that's exactly where we're gonna find out. But on today's episode, we're gonna be talking about this uh, S355 MCS from Evolution Power Tools, which is a 14 inch uh, miter chop saw, but it has a lot of interesting features and capabilities, and this thing is a beast. So if you wanna know more about this, stick with us. So this is the Evolution S355 MCS mitering chop saw with a 14 inch cutting capacity. If you buy it as a kit, you will get a mild steel blade built for heavy duty cutting, but you can also buy other blades such as aluminum, non-ferrous metals, and all kinds of other stuff. Let's talk about the quick specs. This has a 15 amp motor and the no load speed capacity is 1450 RPMs. The cable or the power cord that comes with it is about 10 feet. Uh, the number of teeth on the blade that you get on the uh, mild steel blade is a 66 tooth blade it's a one inch arbor and it's 14 inch diameter okay so let's talk about cutting capacity mild steel like maximum thickness you could cut up to half an inch stainless steel assuming you had stainless steel blade you can cut 13 64th of an inch if you're cutting a square tube you could cut four and three quarters right if you're cutting at 90 degrees but if you're cutting at a left uh, a left miter it's about four inches or four, or four by four inch uh, tubing uh, if you're cutting at a right miter it's it's a lot less and we'll talk about that in a bit but it's one and three quarters by one and three quarters okay so make sure you keep that in mind you just have to work the miter the way you need it to work okay but if you're cutting a rectangular tube at 90 degrees you can cut up to six and a half inch by four inch but a rectangular tube at 45 degrees you can only cut uh, four and a half inch to one and three quarters of an inch round tubing at 90 degrees you can cut up to four and three quarters round tube at 45 degrees you can cut up to 40 or, or four inches and the minimum cutoff piece for anything that you're cutting mainly for safety materials and it's sliding and flying around stuff like that is five sixteenths of an inch and this product is definitely heavy it was definitely I don't want to say a struggle, but it was not easy trying to wield it around and install the legs and all that stuff on it, okay? So this product weighs in at a whopping 77 pounds for just the tool, okay? Imagine if you had it shipped, I'm assuming it's gonna be more than that. But if you do buy this, uh, rest assured, you're gonna be guaranteed for at least three years because Evolution Power Tools, and especially all the new stuff that they're selling right now these days, is guaranteed for up to three years. All right, so let's talk about the obvious stuff here. I've taken the arm or the clamping arm off for a second so we can look a better, uh, closer look at this, but we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Obviously, I have this uh, miter saw on a rigid stand. Um, I, I did wanna talk about that main just for a second. This obviously doesn't come with it. Um, the main reason I have it on this is mainly because I don't use this saw all the time, but when I do use it, it is a lot easier to use it standing up, okay? So uh, just having a stand that you use other tools on, just buy, I forgot how much these, arms were like 30 bucks or something and you could just swap multiple tools on and off the stand and it has large big wheels so it rolls easily and on a tool like this you want to use large wheels mainly because this tool is heavy like i said 77 pounds okay the one thing i will say about this and i'm not trying to bash on the rigid tools or anything like that is mainly because uh, this saw is pretty heavy and the way that this stand works is that the legs clamp against two two pieces of tubing that hold it on there so it's not necessarily the sturdiest um, I'm not trying to say don't do this, but I'm just wanting you to know it's not as sturdy as one of the uh, miter saw stands that have the frame that you just bolt straight down into the frame, you know, kind of like the yellow uh, DeWalt uh, big frame one, right? So I just wanted to point that out, but you know, this works fine. I've used it this way a lot. I've cut actually a lot of material on this. So uh, with that being said, let's get into it. 
Now, obviously, the first obvious thing here is that it does miter both directions, a 45, uh, actually 46 each direction, but it has a positive stop at zero, 15, 22.5, 30, and 45. And in case you didn't need, or you needed a miter at some angle that was not that, just put it wherever you need it and then clamp this down, right? And then you will be good, it won't really move, okay? So that uh, works pretty well. And I will go ahead and say, I'm not gonna pull the gauge out and, and measure this mainly because if you're cutting metal and stuff like that, most likely, um, even if it's off by a hair, the, well, the welds and stuff you're gonna be putting on it are gonna fill it in, it's gonna be just fine, actually. So, um, but I will tell you after cutting enough material, this uh, is not off egregiously or anything like that, so it, it's fine, okay? So, uh, with that being said, uh, let's talk about the other obvious stuff here is this uh, clamping system. So, uh, this clamp is interesting mainly because um, it has this quick uh, clamp down feature or quick release feature, which allows you to pretty much put it wherever you want then press this blue button, and then you can move the clamp up and down pretty quick, right? So it's gonna actually encourage people to more use it or not be annoyed by it instead of one you have to turn all the way because the ones you have to turn all the way, you know, everybody gets annoyed and nobody really uses them, right? So uh, this feature is nice because you know you can move this wherever you want, move this how quickly you want, then just fine tune the last pressure adjustment there, uh, which is good. Also, the other interesting thing about this clamp is that besides, you know, there's three holes back here, you could pop this in on here or here or here, but obviously, you know, this is really close. So if you're cutting something, you know, that you need to clamp here on, don't expect to be able to clamp it because look, okay? Uh, with that being said, this clamp is interesting mainly because it's got flat feet here with ball bearings or like a ball here or pin detent. So if you're holding something flat, that's how you wanna use it. But if you're holding something not flat, you wanna use uh, this piece here, which actually uh, allows you to clamp round tubing, square material, diamond shaped material, all kinds of stuff. And they've actually done a pretty good job with this because this pin detent here actually allows you to put it on um, here and not have to worry about it falling off because the pin adds the pressure on here. But yes, it does fall off pretty easily, mainly because it's not a full, uh, pos or a full secure securement, if that makes sense. But it does, uh, it's nice that they added that feature of the pin detent that helps prevent uh, it from sliding off, right? So look at that. It's pretty sturdy, but like I said, it slides off sometimes, okay? So with that being said, let's go ahead and turn it this way. And I did wanna show you um, the main reason for the cutting capacity being limited when you're mitering is watch this corner right here, okay? So this corner, if you miter to the right, all of the uh, uh, hinge mechanism and stuff back there actually come up to this fence. And then if you're cutting anything, I think it's like a larger than the inch and a quarter or something like that, you can't place it against this side of the fence, which means you can't really miter uh, big material in this direction because this thing pops out here, okay? So if you needed to cut that huge miter on a big piece of material, you're gonna have to figure out how you're working and then make sure you cut it on this side using this miter, mainly because of that piece here. So um, as you can see here, this fence um, is there, but the fence is nice mainly because the fence itself is knurled, okay? So it does have some, you know, positive friction type material on it, right? So if you look at the fence, it's about three and three, three eighths, right? If you look at it that way. But if you wanna cut something on this miter, remember, you can do that, okay? So uh, that's interesting. Also, let's go take a look at these holes here. If you want to wondering what these holes are, it's mainly what they call bench dogs. So if you have bench dogs or something like that, you could use it on here. Um, I actually don't use it for that. The one thing I did use it for is I actually just put a piece here that helped me make a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's like a jig, it's like a stop block that help you cut a lot of repetitive cuts. So that was easy. But other than that, um, don't worry too much about these holes, mainly because it's open all the way on the bottom. So it won't just collect, um, I can't even think, the shavings, right? It, can't, it won't collect that material. So it just falls through, okay? So with that being said, let me bring in the uh, clamping arm, which is very nice. So this right here is a clamping arm, and I did want to show you this a little bit up close. It does have, um, what is it, positive stop marks on each side of this, these tubes that actually fit in right here. In order to put it in, let me do this because it'll be easier to put it in this way. So put it in here. 
There you go. Make sure you put it in at the same time because it's a positive system of equal lengths. If you don't put it in at the same time, uh, it gets a little bit difficult. But as you saw on there, uh, because of those little rings, you can actually put this at certain levels, right? So it kind of sticks there at certain levels. And then if you need it to be super secure there, you know, just twist the, uh, what do you call it? The locking pins, the lock screws right here, right? And then you'll be good because it holds there just fine. So let me move this head up. And so the interesting thing about this is that this right here is pretty much exactly the same uh, clamping system as the one I showed you earlier. It's got the two balls right here to help you clamp flat material. Also got uh, the grooves here to help you cut or clamp round, diamond, square, all kinds of other material that aren't flat, okay? So as you saw right there, I was able to get it off really easily and it just slides on that uh, cast iron bar. And the way that this works is that it can just put it down, then tighten it, right? But if I take this off, I can actually move it real quick, okay? So to show you that here, let me just go ahead and find something like this, right? Had a material here, put it here, close it, tighten it down, you're good, okay, see? No, I didn't tighten that tight, but if I tighten it down harder, it's not going anywhere. Whereas this material, right, slides easy. What really helps people use the clamp, and I know a lot of people don't like using clamps, but it's a pretty, uh, clamping is really important mainly because you don't want to be things flying everywhere. It helps keep things secure. So if you hold it here, you know, you just got to tighten it down and it won't go anywhere. You can't pull it up because it's under, uh, what is it, compression, because you're compressing the material against the fence. Uh, but if you want to pull it up, right, you just have to loosen it a little bit and then you can pull it up, slide it out. So clamping it actually works really quick, okay? So just to show you some of that stuff in action, let me go ahead and just pull this uh, piece of black pipe here, right? And with the black pipe, because of the grooves, I can just clamp it right there, right, like so. Actually, you probably don't want to do that mainly because it's not going to be flat on the, on the bottom here. So one thing you could do is you could flip it around and then get the profile this way, which helps you hold against this bottom part to uh, the inside corner of the fence, right? So if you do this, right, actually put this down, hold it there, and you see how this clamp raises up. So it's pressing against the corner of that fence. You can just turn this around, do that, close, press against down the corner of the fence. And look at this. If you put enough force on it, this isn't going anywhere. The entire uh, stand is shaking, okay? So in case you're cutting off smaller pieces and stuff and you don't want to fly around, you can use this clamp here. Uh, most likely, I don't always use this clamp here and that's probably a bad habit. Uh, mainly just because the usually when I'm cutting something like this, it's stable enough that I don't have to do this because it's clamped on both sides. And depending on what you're doing and how much you're cutting, I would definitely recommend um, clamping on both sides just in case, you know, something goes flying because you don't want that. Flying metal, extremely dangerous, okay? So while we're here, let me show you some other material that you can really cut. So if you wanted to cut something like this, right, you could put it up, hold it flat against this corner, right? And you don't have to use these uh, uh, clamping jigs, but you can mainly because this part flat here is still flat, right? So I usually don't like to take these off mainly because I'll just end up losing them, right? Uh, some people will say, oh, I'll take that off and just use the flat part of the clamp feet. And that's probably the best thing, but you know, I'm just not gonna do that mainly because I just don't wanna feel like losing these things. So you just clamp this down here, right? And you're pretty good to go. Uh, I personally wouldn't cut it like this, mainly because once you cut past this, it's fine. Cutting up to here is gonna be fine, but cutting down here is you're gonna be cutting like a longer piece of metal. So on something like this, you know, depending on how you wanna interpret your instructions, um, they probably recommend you either cutting it like this, right, at this corner, so that way it's cutting all the way through and any time the blade is cutting a material, it's a small piece of material at a time, which one, reduces the heat on the, on the blade teeth and also you're not cutting downwards into where the teeth are digging in and then have to dig back out. That actually uh, really reduces the lifespan of the teeth. So if you wanna hold it this way, which is probably the best way, the clamps actually work the best to hold this because you can just hold it here, right? Put this in, hold it this way, right? Put this down, hold it this way, and then you're good to go. So that way, cutting material like that is probably the best way to cut a piece of angle iron 
Um, and that's, I think that's probably what they recommend in the book. So otherwise, uh, let me, that's enough with the clamping material because you know that's pretty uh, straightforward. Let's go ahead and talk about the other pieces going on with this saw. All right, so moving on to the rest of the saw, as you can see here, this is just a pin to hold the chop saw part down. So let me bring the chop saw down here, push this in. As you can see right here, this is a brushed motor. You're gonna have to replace this every once in a while, but you know, uh, if, you're, if you're doing a lot of production work, you probably will, but if you're not doing too much production work, you're gonna be fine. This right here is a shield, so metal shavings don't come back flying at you in case you need to lock the arbor and um, change the blade. This is where that arbor lock is. But other than that, on this side of the saw, there's not too much other stuff going on. I just wanted to point out, remember to remember that, okay? All right, so this is what the uh, this the left side of the saw looks like. You know, there's really nothing too special uh, going on with this side, except for this is probably where the head hold down mechanism is. And this spring is, you know, it's pretty sturdy. Uh, hasn't had seen a ton of use, but I'm sure it'll wear out eventually or wear down eventually to make it a little bit easier. Uh, I'll go around to the back side before we go ahead and talk about the rails. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about these rails here. So as you can see here, it does have a rail system that does move. We'll go ahead and show you this side when you get back to it, right? But it does move, allows you to move the head of the saw. There's three positive stops, one right here, another one right there, right? And another one right here. And what that really helps is the part where the blade comes down against the fence. There is a positive way or the best way to cut uh, material with the blade and there's a piece of paper that comes in the instruction manual or with saw that tells you exactly where to put it kind of like you know if you're cutting a small piece of material you want the arbor part to be you know vertically aligned with that small piece of material to get you know maximum uh, blade life and best cut on it i'm sure it also has something to do with reducing kickback and you know things flying around but that's probably the best way if you're cutting a piece of an angle iron right you want that arbor to be at the apex or the diamond part of that, right? That way, it's the best way to cut that. Not this way, not this way. Uh, if you wanna cut a piece of square tubing, you know, the check mark means that's probably the best way to do it. So you wanna move it out here. If you're wondering what that says, it's the, uh, if you follow this line, it pretty much means use that stop right there, okay? But if you're cutting a uh, piece of square tubing, you wanna put it up on an angle and put it like so, right? That's pretty much, what that means. And that's what helps you get larger capacities uh, cut with the saw. It is a 14 inch uh, cutting wheel, but in order to maximize and get the best cut safely, that is what it's for. Piece on the back here, um, it, it serves two purposes. And if you're, somebody could argue, if you're really using it on stand, you don't need it, but I like to leave it there because the secondary purpose. So the primary purpose of this is one, is to help it to not pull all the way through and push it like it's a stop block, right? I kind of accomplished that with just the screws. But the other purpose of it is, if you have it in a position where the, uh, the what do you call it, the head is all the way back, and if you lift it up, right, if you had a piece, if you had this on the, a flat material, this would kind of support the weight of the pivoting head and the head so that the saw doesn't tip backwards, okay? So uh, that's primarily the main purpose of this, but I do like it on there, uh, mainly because it does provide the extra support and I'm probably gonna lose it if I take it off, okay? So on the back side, you can see, uh, you know, there's one place to put it, two places to put it. You can't really use that one if you're cutting at 90, but if you are cutting at a miter, you can use that one. Um, there are two spots on this, actually no, there's only one spot on, or no, there are two spots on this side too. Um, pretty much looks exactly like that. It doesn't have like a set screw or whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, you can always go find one and get one if you needed to, okay? But that's what this side of the saw looks like. All right, so this is obviously the right hand part of the saw. You can see, you know, this lever arm right here. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this so we can actually look up close right, or get a better view. Uh, so let's talk about this sliding arm again. Like I said, right here, um, you can take this pin, pull it out, and there are three positive stops. They all have holes in them that allows you to stop it down so you can get the best cutting angle. Uh, in theory, you could put it at a wherever you want and then clamp this down, right, just in case you had a material that was, you know, awkwardly shaped or just wasn't at one of the three best ones, but that is not recommended. So make sure you use one of the three positive stops. And if you are using the positive stop, you could also lock it down. But I did want to point out that, you know, you could technically put it wherever you want to lock it down. The problem is um, just the clamp by itself may or may not be strong enough. So as you're cutting, putting a uh, downforce on it, it may move. So, you know, just be wary of that. But other than that, you don't have too many things going on there. Okay. 
uh, one thing that keeps always happening to me, you did see it earlier, I did just pinch my finger against this clamping lever and for some reason I always do that, okay? So uh, there is a Allen wrench that you can use to change the blade. Blade change is pretty simple. Just loosen this a hair, move this, swap it. Uh, it's easy to do this mainly because, you know, the, there is an arrow pointing the blade goes this direction. And if you look at the blade, the blade also has an arrow that says go this direction. So just make sure the arrows are going the same direction and you are good to go, okay? And this uh, key for storing or switching the blade is on this side of the tool. So let's talk about this part right here. So uh, this part is, I don't wanna say it's a no zero clearance slot, but it's pretty big. That's uh, kind of why they don't want you to cut, you know, two small pieces of material because it'll just go flying. It'll get caught in here. But uh, what generally happens is when you're cutting, the theory is that you want all the metal sparks or not the sparks, all the metal shavings to fly into here. In reality, it really doesn't work like that. Uh, unless I don't know what material they were kind of make that happen. I guess the idea of it is nice, but um, I want to say I want to say less than half of the material just goes flying everywhere, and that's trying to cut the material in the best position as suited by the instructions. But it is nice. So if you had a bucket, you could kind of put it down there. Although you know it's all over on the backside in reality. And um, I do want to say something about this blade here, mainly because. Uh, we did make a lot of cuts. I don't know how many cuts that we made so far, but I know that I made at least, um, let's see, what is it? If it has 24, at least a minimum of 12 cuts in uh, angle iron each way to build the shelf that we were building. So these teeth work really well, or it still lasted so long. And I would say the maximum or the best way to uh, maximize the uh, life of the blade is to cut it the way that, you know they kind of instruct you on the instructions but also let the blade fully stop spinning before you let the head up mainly because sometimes a material can kind of get caught while it's still spinning and either one send metal flying or also damage the blade okay and also when you're cutting make sure you're not you know like i said put something flat here where the blade has to dig down and back up because that definitely reduces the life of the blade but also just put even pressure and let the tool do the work don't force it down uh, mainly because uh, this is the downside of this is that sometimes you can kind of feel that it's it's, I don't want to say vibrating, but it's a little bit wobbly. Uh, that's the one thing I think they could really improve on this saw. So as you kind of put downforce on it, um, if you're a perfectionist, you can kind of see that it wobbles just a little bit. Right now, the entire saw is wobbling because the uh, stand isn't the sturdiest, but when you're cutting a thicker material, it will, um, I want to say vibrate just a little bit. And it's not like, actually, I don't think this blade has any, uh, anti-vibration vents or anything like that but uh, this blade is not designed to spin super fast and this blade not sure if you can see here is made in japan all right so what can we say about this tool all right first of all let's go ahead and say there are a lot of ways to cut metal and like i mentioned earlier um primarily the ways that we've been using the most is this saw right here which is a milwaukee m18 what is it 2982-20 which is an eight inch metal cutting saw that helps you bring you know that helps you bring the tool to the material and you can just kind of cut uh, exactly where it is. But pretty much it's in short terms, it's just a circular saw. The downside to this is it's really hard to get miter cuts accurately. Um, even if you're super skilled, I'm not saying I'm super skilled, but even if a super skilled person, it's just not the same as, you know, wiggling this around as your uh, viewfinder here and trying to get perfectly lined up to the cut, right? That's just not that easy. Uh, a few things that I've learned with the saws doing it is, you know, sometimes you can just pull this up, line it up perfectly where you need it, and then just drop the saw, right, to cut the material. Obviously, that's not best for the blade life, but that is a little trick that I did uh, figure out uh, or learn or whatever as we were using it. So that does help, but you know, even just the case, sometimes it's just difficult. The good thing about this saw is that, you know, all the metal shavings really get caught here. Not all, but I want to say 90 something percent get caught here. So that works pretty well. And that is a tool that you can usually bring to the material, which is sometimes better because the material for cutting metal is usually pretty heavy, okay? So uh, this tool is a tool you, you pretty much stand in place and you bring the material to the tool, but the positive part is you get accurate, consistent cuts pretty much all the time, okay? So this saw is nice, but it will set you back somewhere between, I think it's eight to $900. You can find it on sale, Black Friday, stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, and you can buy from all kinds of places. Uh, evolutionpowertool.com or amazon.com and stuff like that but they're still pretty much anywhere around 850 bucks okay so you can go ahead and say well is this the only saw on the market let's talk about that so uh 
Technically speaking, this saw, I believe, is the only saw that's currently on the market that I know of. That is a metal cutting miter saw, okay? But uh, you can technically get the 18 volt Bosch uh, Pro Factor Surgeon, which is a uh, double bevel dual compound miter saw, if that even makes sense. Um, and you can just get a Diablo uh, cement blade and put it on the saw, but you have to run that saw or run it in eco mode, which is the lowest speed setting for the saw. Uh, the main reason I'm telling you this is because I'm just telling you something I've done and use it that way. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm telling you I've done it. Uh, this is one of those things that say, do as I say, as I do. Uh, but um, even at the lowest speed, it's still a couple hundred RPMs fast, uh, too fast, according to the blade, the blade's max RPM speed. Um, so I'm always wearing like a, a clear face or face shield. I always wear glasses, obviously, um, and then stuff like that. But um, it will get the job done. The downside to that is uh, the metal that's cutting is usually pretty hard. So on eco mode, it doesn't have the most power. Uh, it won't always have consistent power or a lot of power throughout the cut. That's something you need to be aware of. So you can kind of deal with that and make it work. Um, and I've done it that way for I would say many years. Um, but with this saw it actually changes things up a lot mainly because all that stuff in the back of your mind is you don't have to worry about it. You just, you know, get the job done. So obviously we built, well, not obvious, but we built the shelf and you're just making consistent cuts, not worrying about it pretty quick. Actually has really sped things up with this saw. We don't do metal work all the time, but when we do, this saw definitely helps get it done. Okay. So with that being said, hope this video helped you guys out. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, Otherwise, get back to work, have a great day, and we'll see you guys next time.